So good morning everybody and welcome back to the post tea session. As I promised before carrying on with the examples and interaction, we would go back to the pointer example and have our first quiz. I hope all of you are ready with uh, clickers in your hands. So here is the quiz. Here was the pointer example and in the pointer example to recapitulate briefly, we have said that we have M, N and three element array A which was float, M and N were integers. We declared two pointers P and Q, P representing integer and Q representing float. We went through the assignment operation of pointers to addresses P equal to and M and N equal to star P saying that the number n that is printed out will be exactly 5 as for m was because m gets assigned to n. In the second case, we said a0 is 15.5, q is equal to and a0 and q++. Now if we look at the next set of statements, star q is assigned 25.0, again I have q++ and star q is assigned a1 plus 10. Notice that here we are actually doing pointer manipulation and we are using q++ to add uh, increment the pointer. Put num f, put num f a2, a1 will tell us the values. And we have seen that the values that we get are 25 and 35 for a1 and a2 which are the correct values as we would like them to have. However, the doubt that we have is that we are seeing q++ here is that the correct statement. So the quiz is about that. I am now displaying the quiz question here. In the above program, we have star q equal to 25, q++ plus plus, and star q equal to a1 plus 10. Since a is float, each element is 4 bytes long. Yet, we are simply saying q++. Plus plus. Our understanding of a plus plus operator is that it adds 1 to the contents. So q++ plus plus should be advancing the value of q by 1. Why does then the program work correctly? Here are the four options. A, it actually does not. The next element happens to have a value 35.0. B, q++ plus plus always adds 4 to q because the size of q is 4 bytes. C, q refers to a float type data. Compiler knows that float occupies 4 bytes. Hence the instruction q++ is translated to add 4 to q and d none of the above. So this is the quiz, you already explained the quiz, they are the actual answers a, b, c, d. I would request you to enter quiz number 10, coordinators should do that quiz number 10 and collect responses. I will wait for exactly 1 minute from this point, 15 seconds more for you to type your final answer. Remember that if you have not pressed lock, then you can still choose to respond differently. Okay, time is up. Now I will collect responses. We have received responses from Surat, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Amrita Kolam, Trishur. Received from Somaya Vidya Vihar, MGM Nander, and Amrita Koyam Tour. We have now some more. Uh, we have Amruta Bangalore, Nirma Ahmedabad and we have, uh, we already had MGM Nanded or College of Engineering Pune. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 centers. Uh, maybe we will wait for a minute or so to check whether the FTP comes. In the meanwhile, let me explain to the participants that the responses that you gave were actually instantly collected by the receiver. Uh, sitting in the same hall as you are sitting and that receiver is supposed to have created a XML file and that XML file contains individual responses tagged to the clicker IDs. And those responses in that file, that file is supposed to be automatically transmitted to a central location here through an FTP protocol. What happens sometimes is that if the machine connected to network at your end sits behind a firewall or sits behind a proxy server, perhaps the FTP connection does not get automatically executed. We had the same problem here in IIT 
what we have done is we have got permission from iit network to create a connection which goes without the iit bombay firewall it actually has a situation from security point of view but we got a special permission and in subsequent uh, workshops we will actually set up a completely independent network so that we can go out similar things will have to be done by different centers uh, can we refresh it once again we have received from nit suratkal 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 5 uh, incidentally for those centers which have actually received but are unable to transmit file we have said nit surat gujarat is having a query can we go over to nit surat and then come back again yeah sir i am sonal from nit surat actually we wanted to ask it in which language the compiler is developed uh, which language first c compiler in which language first c compiler was developed but the first compiler was written in the assembly language of a machine called pdp7 in fact the unix operating system was first developed in the assembly language of that computer then c language compiler was developed in that assembly language and once the c compiler was developed c was used again to rewrite the unix operating system so it was the first example probably in the world where an operating system was written in a higher level language and subsequently almost all operating systems are now written in c or c derivatives sona college has a query let's just go over to sona college good morning yeah please go ahead don't wait sir, what is the need for using pointers to arrays when array itself acts like a pointer for uh, for noting the subsequent elements uh, this is a question lady i have been asking all my programmer friends for last so many years uh, ordinarily there should be no need for us to use pointers and that is what i explained that the examples that i have constructed are artificial although uh, most c programmers tend to use pointers very heavily i wonder whether they stop and think whether the pointer usage is absolutely essential or not however you will soon find in our discussions the actual need for the pointers very specifically when you pass structures and when you pass functions you will find that passing large structures without passing pointers would be counterproductive in terms of very heavy work that is to be done especially if the structure has very huge amount of data there are this and similar instances where pointers are absolutely dictated or mandated because of the efficiency uh, professor kannan is sitting in pune so uh, let's very briefly go over to pune and say hello to him uh, hello professor patak yeah i came to uh, so this uh, visit here is uh, unexpected um, uh, rather my visit to pune today was well planned but i was not planning to come here only it occurred to me this morning why not uh, visit uh, the nearest college and see if i can uh, see how the participants are i came to mit coe in the morning i gave inaugurated a scilab workshop and then after the workshop somebody else is giving a one hour talk and uh, mit coe is just about 15 minutes from the model colony where this uh, symbiosis uh, center is at so i am at symbiosis i can hear you very well your uh, videos also is coming really well mm, i thought i would also interact with you through this um, facility from pune and also talk to the participants here that is the reason why i came thank you professor kalnan in fact uh, i wish that other uh, senior leaders in sister organizations such as isro uh, mhrd uh, are able to over the next 3 days at least come and say hello to the participants and see uh, how the workshop is going i believe we have established these 650 all attending participating colleague teachers and the 22 center coordinators and their staff have achieved a great first in the country uh, for which i would also like to compliment all of them okay so let's get back to the quiz now 
here we have on the display the quiz results. Uh, we will now view all the responses. So, this is the response chart. I wish my clicker team converts that from student response to participant response because uh, my colleague 650 teachers who are sitting there are not exactly students, but I hope uh, people do not mind because ultimately all of us teachers are perpetual students of the subject that we teach. So, I believe that is okay. Uh, let me see, does it tell me the numbers by the way? Yes, sir. The okay. So, on the left hand side I can see the numbers. Now, uh, this reminds me exactly of the Kon Banega Karodpati audience poll where the correct answer has maximum respondents, but there are non-zero responses uh, for other uh, answers as well. So, A has about 5 responses, B has about 9 responses and D has 1 response. Now, let me just go back to the actual query. If this is the query, notice that we have several responses for B, large number of responses for C and a very few for A and D. Actually, A is not correct because the next element may not have a value of 35. In fact, if this is the correct answer, this can be cross-checked by simply running the program many times because if you run the program many times, then every time the value in the next location will not happen to be 35 and if it consistently gives you 35, it should clarify that this cannot be the correct answer. So, if students give this answer, this is the explanation we can give to them because this can be empirically proven. However, it is not the correct answer because there is a correct answer in this set. Option B says Q plus plus always adds 4 to Q because the size of Q is 4 bytes. Please note that the size of Q merely determines the total number of unique locations Q can address. Therefore, the size of Q has nothing to do with what value is there inside the Q and with what value that value should be incremented. Therefore, the incrementing of the value of Q has nothing to do with size of Q and that is why the answer B is wrong. Answer D is wrong because as I said there is a correct answer and indeed C is the correct answer. Let us analyze this correct answer. Q refers to float type data. Compiler knows that a float occupies 4 bytes. Hence, the instruction Q++ is translated to add 4 to Q. It is important that we choose this wording. We cannot say that Q is incremented by 1 means that Q is incremented by 4. Nothing of that sort can automatically happen. Now, who does this translation? The translation of all our instruction is done by the compiler. Ordinarily, if I say N++ or I++ or J++ or I equal to I plus 1 or J equal to J plus 1, all these mean to us increment value of i or j or m by 1. That is because the compiler translates this into an increment instruction for the associated variable and that increment is increment by 1. In case of q that must not happen because q is a pointer which refers to a floating point value. Now, the compiler knows already that q refers to a floating point value which is 4 bytes long. Remember, that is the reason why it is very, very important to associate a type with Q. Suppose Q was a pointer to a short int, then the short int occupies 2 bytes. If Q was a pointer to a double, then a double occupies 8 bytes. And consequently, the increment to Q, although we increment it by 1, the increment must happen either of 2 or of 8 depending upon whether it is short int or whether it is double. Because the underlying data type is float and float occupies 4 bytes, the Q value, actual value must be incremented by 4. Ordinarily Q++, I will repeat, if Q was an ordinary variable, Q++ would always be translated by the compiler 
in an instruction which increments q by 1. But because q is a pointer, the compiler behaves intelligently and the machine instruction it generates, it will not add 1 to q, but it will add actually the size of float to q. So, on in our program, we seemingly increment it by 1. But what it means is next location of that type and the 1 is to be interpreted in that sense only. However, the actual increment is always by the size of the underlying data type which happens to be 4. I would like to notice that from amongst us, many of us had perhaps some doubt about it. Therefore, it is only correct to assume that many of the students when we teach them pointers should have similar doubts. In fact, some of them will be convinced that whenever we say q++ plus plus, the pointer increments only by 1. It is therefore important that when we teach pointer, we dispel this doubt perhaps by giving a similar example. This is the reason why I had constructed this example to illustrate the point. The other point that has been proven is that we have for the first time collected for an online quiz responses from as many as 12 centers online and I am sure that the remaining centers we will get the files in due course of time. Tomorrow I shall report to you just for the sake of interest how many actual XML files we are able to collect and how many responses we have got. Imagine once we perfect this technology then for all subsequent 12 workshops that we propose to conduct under this mission we will be actually be able to say which participant responded to which query rightly or wrongly. In case of teachers, it is not very important whether the answer is right or wrong, but it is important to note that people have thought and responded and of course they clarify their doubt. However, in case of students, it is important to collect that response and store that value because we may be able to use that value for the actual evaluation. I will just mention once again that such a speedy evaluation of student response is not possible in any conventional means. So thank you very much clicker team and thank you all the center coordinators for having done fantastic work to actually make this uh, particular clicker idea work and I am sure that within the next three days itself we will have a, uh, a increasingly better response in terms of number of participants responses being collected. And of course, by the next uh, uh, workshop, we would have sorted out all the problems. There is a question from PSG College, how scan and printf function operate with different arguments are passed if, they are, if there is any overloading? Very good question, but this is not a question pertinent to C programming language. Please note that operator overloading is a notion of object oriented programming languages which for example is C++. In traditional C there is no notion of operator overloading and therefore even if some smart students who have read ahead uh, of, of the syllabus ask you this question, uh, you must tell them that this question is not relevant in the context of C programming. However, independently to the individual students you may try to satisfy the query but for which you have to go into the notions of operator overloading which requires actually a fairly elaborate discussion for the students. So we will pass that. There was one more question from somewhere, question from NIT Surat. Uh, sir, my question belongs to the yesterday class. Uh, in yesterday, you have said that the all the memory uh, variables of a program is located consecutive fashion. I want to know, sir, that uh, it, uh, it, ha uh, it happens always or in some cases uh, non-consecutive memory may be also located. Uh, so let me repeat this question and answer. The question is whether the allocation of memory is always to consecutive locations or sometimes it could be to non-consecutive locations. So the answer to this is Firstly, this behavior has nothing to do with programming language or programming concepts. As a matter of fact, our answer to such queries of the students should be that it does not simply matter. All that it matters is that whatever be the variables and arrays that I have declared in my program, 
they are properly allocated memory somewhere. However, the question whether they are allocated consecutive memory or not becomes relevant when we try to use pointers. Suffice it to say then in answer to such a query that as far as arrays are concerned, array elements are always allocated consecutive memory. And that is the reason why I can use pointer arithmetic to access individual successive elements of the array. Whether the individual other variables and different arrays are allocated consecutive memory or not will depend on the compiler. In almost all cases, the compiler will try to allocate memory in a consecutive fashion. Uh, the correct answer is slightly uh, requires us to go slightly into depth. For example, there is a notion of scope. There are certain variables which are declared for the full scope of the function that we write. There are certain external variables. There are also certain variables which are declared within the scope of a for loop or a while loop. Since the scoping rules are different, compiler might want to have a different strategy for handling these things. Memory variables in one function and memory variables in another function may not necessarily occupy consecutive positions one after another. So in a nutshell, the answer is by and large, the compiler will allocate memory in successive locations to different variables. There are two exceptions. One, when the compiler chooses to do so differently because of compulsion such as scoping rules. The second is that if I have defined a structure, then there might be a need depending upon the machine architecture to put some bytes blank. These are called filler bytes if the word boundaries which are inherent property of the machine architecture crossover. For example, suppose I have a three byte character string. Now I allocate three bytes to it. Next is a float and the float will take fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh byte. But suppose the machine architecture requires that floating point numbers should always be allocated memory, the starting point of which is divisible by four. Then I can't start it on the fourth byte I have to start it on the fifth byte. Or if 0 was the first address, 0, 1, 2, 3 is occupied by the character string. Byte 4 must be uh, 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 0, 1, 2 is occupied by the three bytes of character string. And byte number 3, which is actually the fourth byte, cannot start a floating point. In which case, the compiler either might do a jugglery of fitting a one character variable from somewhere else there, or it might simply leave that as a blank such blank bytes in between are called padding bytes. This is entirely a compiler feature and the correct answer to your students should be that while such things may happen, please don't worry about them. As long as the memory is allocated properly to all your variables and arrays, please do not worry. At the most, some bytes may go free and not utilized, but it does not really matter in modern times. Uh, to immediately follow this up, I would like to take up the simple demonstration of a structure. Most of you would be familiar with these structures, but this example is constructed to demonstrate how exactly structures can be used in our program. So suppose, as I said, if I want to combine information which is seemingly belonging to different data types, yet the totality of the information is not disparate, but it is all concerned with a particular type of object or entity. So here is an example. Suppose I want to store information about students. Now, a student has a name which may be 30 characters long. A student may have a roll number which may be 8 characters long. A student may be staying in some hostel, depending upon the hostel naming scheme. For example, in IIT, all hostels are numbered. So we have 13 hostels starting from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on. And these are integer numbers. Then there are marks and the marks could be in say 2, 3, 4, 5 or 8 different categories. For example, each student will get marks in a quiz, each student will get marks in one or more assignments, each student will get marks in mid-semester, in end-semester, in project. So if there are 5 categories of marks, then I would like to record 5 different marks for each student and therefore I may need an array 
which is described here as float marks phi. Finally, there may be a three character grade. So, we have two character grades here such as AA, AB, BC, etc., etc. The two character grade is stored in a three element array because you remember that string must have a terminating uh, backslash null. So, consequently, I have a 30 character name, I have a 8 character roll number, I have an integer hostel, I have 5 uh, sort of locations for floating point uh, values for marks and I have a 2 character uh, grade. Now, all of this refers to a single student in the sense that every student of my institute will have these attributes. If I describe these arrays and roll number and everything differently, it will be very difficult for me to keep track of which student's name I am talking about and whether I am talking about his or her marks or somebody else's marks. Typically, this problem is traditionally solved by declaring many arrays, one dimensional or multiple column arrays, which are of different types. For example, I can declare a character array of name 1000 by 31. I can declare a roll number array of care 1000 by 9. I can declare hostel 1000 as integer. There aren't 1000 hostels, but I will use these 1000 element arrays to store the records of each one student with one index value. Say 35th student, then 35th element of that large array will be named. Again, it will be a two dimensional array, etc. Et Instead, a far better mechanism is to define a structure. So, what we are defining here is called a structure prototype, struct student info type. This is the name I have given to this structure. This means that student info type has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 components. Now, I can treat student info type as if it was a data type of my own. So, this is how I am creating my own data type. So, just as I have int, I have float, I have double, I now have student info type as another type. And whenever I declare variables of a data type, the memory locations get allocated to store values of that particular data type. When I say int or float for example, similarly I can use the declaration struct student info type. This is actually a type definition. Just as I have int float, I have struct student info type. And now I am writing the variable name s or a array s list. So, s list is an array of structures and if there are 1000 elements, I can actually store data for 1000 students here. Note that every element of this array s list is a complete structure. So, each element has components name, role, hostel, marks and grade. Similarly, s which is a variable which is of the structure type S itself has all these five components. I can also declare a pointer to these structures by saying struct student info type star p. Notice that by when we have integer, we say int star p, float, float star q. Here we cannot say student info type star p because student info type is not the complete description of the type. The new type that we have defined is actually called struct student info type. So, we should remember and remind our students that the new type being defined is not student info type, but struct student info type, meaning it is a structure whose name happens to be student info. Type. And of that type, a pointer is being defined here. So, struct student info type star p. This program continues to illustrate some usages of the uh, structure. For example, I can say s dot name 0 equal to n. So, s is a structure variable. Since it has 5 components, one of the components is name. s dot name is the way to refer to that component. s dot any component is the way to refer to any component. Since the component is an array, I am arbitrarily showing how a single character n can be defined uh, to be the, uh, can be assigned to the 0th element of name. Since name 0 is a character array, s dot name 0 becomes the character array belonging to the structure variable s. 
and this can be treated as a character array anywhere in my program. Similarly, hostel is an integer number. S dot hostel happens to be the hostel number that will get assigned to the element hostel of S. I can say P equal to and S. This is exactly like any other pointer assignment where the address of S is calculated by and S and is assigned to P. Once I assign this address to P, just as I can say S dot name, S dot hostel, I can also refer to these by using the pointer P. However, the way you refer to the elements of a structure using pointer is different. That is illustrated in this printf statement where we say hostel number is percent D and then the reference is made like this P dash greater than sign hostel or P minus sign greater than sign hostel. So this symbol is actually a membership symbol when the left hand side is a pointer. Note that I would have equivalently said S dot hostel. It would mean the same thing. So if I am referring to a structure name, then structure name dot component is the right way of referring it. However, if I assigned a pointer, then pointer hyphen greater than is the right way of referring it. In short, P and this symbol hostel means it is the hostel element of a structure which is pointed to by P. I can get the size of structure by saying size of S. I can get the size of marks by saying size of S dot marks. I can get the size of grade by saying size of S dot grade. And I can get size of P as size of P. That is the pointer. Why I am writing all of this? This is to show you how the sizes of individual components ultimately get added up to the size of the entire structure. To recapitulate, let us very briefly go to the previous uh, slide. Here we have int main structure student info type. This has 31 bytes in name. Remember that backslash 0 has to be included. Then it has 9 bytes in roll number. This makes up 40 bytes. Then there is an integer hostel which will require 4 bytes. Float marks. There are five element array, each one requires four bytes, so this amounts to 20 bytes. And then there is a character array, it is three elements, so it will occupy three bytes. This we know to be the sizes of individual elements. We just want to confirm what happens when the compiler allocates memory. So that is why this segment of the program is written. What is important here is to note that while referring to any member of a structure, we use the dot, so S dot member. But while referring to that member using a structure pointer, we use a hyphen followed by a greater than sign. Please don't look for this symbol on keyboard. There is no single symbol. This is a composite symbol. So we say P hyphen greater than member. There is exactly the same meaning as S dot mem. Uh, let us just go to the questions one by one. Uh, Chennai has a question. If the name is long, the alignment is not neat and correct. How would I solve it? Okay. The question is that if the name is long, say 63 bytes or 74 bytes or whatever, the alignment is not correct. The point again I will make is, why should we bother about the alignment? Let the compiler do the dirty work. These questions, by the way, you will see being raised in the classical textbooks also, belong to an era where the total memory of the computer used to be 64 kilobytes, 512 kilobytes, etc. These days, even a Lallu PC comes with a memory of 1 gigabyte, 2 gigabytes. And the kind of programs that we usually write on our computers do not stress the boundaries of the available memory. And therefore, while allocating the memory, if the alignment requires that few memory bytes are wasted, well, let it be. It is the compiler's job to allocate memory as long as it does it properly, I should not worry. Technically, the question that you raise is important and it should be explained to people that there could be a need for some slack bytes while allocating memory to a, uh, uh, a structure. I will also tell you where this question becomes very relevant. This question becomes very relevant to computer science students who later on have to write compilers and who therefore must understand the nitty-gritties. My own take on this particular aspect is 
that the first course is being taught to all engineering and science students and even management students. And it is not correct to burden them with technical details which are not going to be relevant for the kind of programs that they will write. As far as computer science students are concerned, either in this course, not necessarily though, but in subsequent courses which they do with the computer science department or IT department, there is ample opportunity to explain to them how compilers should be designed, how memory should be allocated, etc. Et in short, this and all related question, I have only one answer. Yes, technically it is correct to understand that such thing may happen, but no, I am not going to be bothered with it. I don't care one hoot how compiler allocates memory as long as all my variables, arrays, structures, and arrays of structures are taken care of. This is exactly what I tell to people in the industry when I work with them on performance monitoring and benchmarking and when people say, I have a 64-bit machine or I have a machine which has so many MIPS rating or my machine can carry out so many floating point operations. To them, as an advisor to people who use general purpose programs, not computer scientists, people like bankers, people like financial institutions, people like railway bridge designers, people like car designers, they all use programming languages such as C to write the applications for either numerical computation or their business data processing. They will have demands on processing efficiency, both the space efficiency and time efficiency. But that is measured in terms of real time required to execute their programs versus the actual time that is available to them. Usually the time available is longer than the time it takes to execute the programs. And therefore, they do not care at all about the underlying technology. In actual usage, my answer to such uh, sort of suggestions is that, look, Mr. So-and-so, for this bank, I need to execute, let us say, 200,000 transactions per hour. Now, whether your computer is 64-bit, whether the memory is aligned properly, whether there is no wastage of byte, I don't care. In fact, I don't care if you yourself personally sit inside that box and correctly deliver 200,000 transactions per hour to me. That is the disdain with which a modern application programmer and a domain expert must treat the computers. The computer, its memory, its processor is meant for me. I am not meant for computer, its processor, its memory. You might say that I am saying exactly opposite of what I advocated some time ago that students must be taught to write efficient programs. Please note that when I say efficient programs should be written, I mean that at our level of understanding and readability, whatever we write should be as efficient as possible. Writing compilers is somebody else's job. And therefore, I, I should neither want to know too much about the nitty gritties of what compiler does or how it should behave. That is not our domain for the first course in programming. Is there any question uh, why it is not possible to assign string constant to character array using this? Uh, well, it is not possible to assign because C language does not permit it. If you ask me, it is the stupid inadequacy of the C programming language. If a, if a string can be assigned to the initial declaration, I don't see why C compiler cannot generate instructions to assign a string to a string array on the left hand side. After all, we do that by writing a loop a, a for instruction or something. And the compiler can very easily do that using exactly the same mechanism. It just so happens that the C language by design does not have this feature and therefore this is not permitted. Of course, an equivalent uh, thing can be very easily done by using one or more of the very strong and powerful functions which are contained in the string.h library. So please read more about string.h library and you will soon be forgiving C compiler for not giving adequate features because all that you need is available and perhaps more is available in the standard C library. As a matter of fact, those of you who are inclined to think in terms of compilers will notice that there are functions in string library which actually permit you to identify tokens and identify different fields. For example, in today afternoon exercise, 
you will spend a lot of programming efforts to locate those commas and identify different fields which lie between the commas. There are functions in C which will permit you to do all of that in one shot, identifying different fields and allocating different fields to, let us say, uh, different portions of memory. But I leave it to further investigation and all the best. Uh, can I go over to the query just uh, why we are mostly using structures even when we have memory advantages in union then structures. Uh, I disagree with this. There are no memory advantages per se in unions over structure. Ultimately, memory will have to be allocated by the compiler. And once again, I will stress that memory advantage in small is not relevant. Memory advantage in large is relevant. So if I have a billion bytes being wasted, I should worry about it. But I have 100 bytes being wasted is not worth the effort of a programmer to look at. Just as in case of time efficiency, it is important to reduce time by even fractions. And therefore, in my time equation, k1 times n square plus k2 times n plus k3, if I can reduce k3 from let's say 2.8 to 1.2, yes, that's an advantage. But if n is large, what I should worry about is to reduce k1 times n square. So I should try to reduce k1. Best, I should try to eliminate the n square term completely. In exactly the equivalent way, memory efficiency should not be our primary concern unless the memory is being wasted very largely. I will give you one example where memory efficiency should be a bother. Suppose you are handling very large arrays and by large, I do not mean 100 by 100. I do not even mean 1000 by 1000. I mean 50,000 by 50,000. Suppose you have a two dimensional array which has 50,000 rows and 50,000 columns. Invariably, you will find such large arrays cannot be accommodated in the memory. Or you are handling 100 digit numbers in a multiplicity in arithmetic. That is where you should worry about memory allocation. I submit once again that struct and unions, while they might have relative advantages and disadvantages, they are small as compared to larger issues. And we should tell our students, while telling them correctly what happens in these two cases, we should tell them not to bother too much about these unless they happen to be part of a larger issue, such as, as I said, 50,000 by 50,000. One question that I will raise for you, since many of you are talking about memory efficiency, imagine that I want to store a large array which is a sparse matrix. Those of you who do not understand sparse matrix, sparse matrices are those which have maximum number of elements as zero and only few elements are ones. Typically these ones happen around uh, along the diagonals of these arrays. So the main diagonal and maybe the uh, neighboring smaller diagonals would have non-zero values, but all other values are zero. Such sparse matrices arise very frequently in large number of scientific and engineering computations. Now you will notice that if I take a normal matrix and allocate it 50,000 by 50,000, the total number of elements allocated are huge, although the actual number of non-zero elements are very few. That is where the creativity of the programmer and the concern for memory efficiency should show. And that is where we need to use techniques which go beyond the conventional programming techniques. I would refer to recipes, uh, numerical recipes in C, which tells you how to handle such memory cases, for example. Badnera has a question. Good morning, sir. I am from uh, PRMITR Badnera, Shirish. Uh, my question is regarding the point. Does the length of a pointer depends on the size of a processor or it's same for 32, 16 or 64 bytes processors? Okay. Uh, good. This question I have tried to answer the earlier. Time it is given as 4 only. Yes. Uh, this 4 is, uh, uh, I will repeat again, this 4 is not a constant value for all computers. This 4 came out because the computer on which I ran that program, which was printing the size, for that computer, the C pointer happened to be 4 bytes. If you run the same program on some other computers, you may get a different value. However, as I mentioned, this value, the size of the pointer, 
yes indeed is often connected with the computer's architecture. So typically if you have a 32-bit machine, a 32-bit architecture, the pointer will be 4 bytes. If you have a 64-bit architecture, the pointer would be 8 bytes. There are a few exceptions, uh, notably an old IBM machine called IBM AS400. They actually, when they created that machine, it's an extremely interesting study to see how abstraction and power of abstraction was used. So while the internal memory kept on evolving from 16-bit to 32-bit as far as architecture was concerned, but the first layer, the machine instruction layer, automatically provided for 128-bit addressing. And they did internal jugglery in electronics or in software to compile these 128-bit addresses to much smaller address space. But to conclude, your question, is, your, your uh, suggestion or your observation is right. Generally, the pointer site is connected with the machine architecture. And the four that you saw here is not at all a universal truth. It merely happens to be the size of the pointer on a particular computer on which I ran that program to determine sizes. It is compiler dependent, it is machine dependent, and generally it is connected with the computer architecture. There is another question. C language is how much comfortable to handle the images as an input? Okay, I will repeat the question. What can be the data type for that? Okay, I will repeat the question. The question is, I think all of you have heard this. How comfortable is C language in handling images and what should be the data type for those images? Okay, so let me answer this question more generically. To the best of my knowledge, there is no programming language which naturally handles images. All programming languages handle images typically as a two-dimensional array of pixel values. And therefore, Every programming language, including C, is either equally comfortable or equally uncomfortable handling digital images. So that is the truthful answer. It should not matter whether you are writing a program in C, C++, Java, Algol, COBOL, C, I mean Fortran, BASIC, whatever. Whichever programming language you choose. To the best of my knowledge, there is no programming language which has a direct underlying type for image. Image is always handled as a two-dimensional array where every element contains a pixel value. In fact, for more complex images such as color images, each pixel value itself has three components, red, blue and green. And you might be required to store each one separately. Or you may artificially combine them by concatenating the 888 bits and therefore a pixel value is reprinted as 24 bits which itself is not even a single number. It 24 bits represent three different components, each one representing a red value, uh, blue value or green value. So such are the nuances. And the, I, to conclude, the answer is no other language, and therefore not even C language, is either comfortable or uncomfortable with image. And there is no native data type in which image can be represented for these programming languages as far as the abstraction to a programmer is concerned. However, if you use object-oriented programming languages such as C++ or Java or C Sharp or n number of other things, then it is possible to define what we call abstract data types in which you can define abstract data type as an image. And you can even perhaps define operators on those images. But these are constructed as part of specialized applications and are not a part of the natural features of a programming language. Indoor has a question, if at machine 1 in takes 2 bytes and at machine 2 in takes 4 bytes, then what is the difference between int and short int at machine 1? Impossible to say because this is a compiler feature and not a machine feature. So the compiler may allocate the same number of bytes to short int and int. Just as for example, in, in uh, our case, we have seen that int and long int have the same size. So this is entirely a compiler feature. And any attempt to say that because on one machine this is like this 
and on other machine this is like that and that is like this and that is like that on these two machines therefore something else should be like that is mere speculation there cannot be any logical reasoning and connectivity it must be examined because all of these in the standard are defined as implementation dependent feature and a specific implementation has to be tested explicitly to find out what are the limits however there are sizes and maximum value limits defined for every implementation in special header files i will try and locate the header file references for you you can examine for any compiler and the associated header files you can examine what these are and that is what will be guaranteed in terms of size independent of in fact the machine architecture or whatever so the implementation will be for specific machines which you can see surat has a question when pointer variable contains only address of any variable then why we declare that pointer variable with data type the pointer variable does not contain address of any variable i repeat the pointer variable explicitly contains the address of a variable of a defined data type once again to go over if a short int takes two bytes and a float takes four bytes then incrementing a pointer of short int type will add two to the pointer value incrementing a pointer of float type will add four to the value e exactly in order to determine how pointer arithmetic can be done the compiler must know the pointer is associated with which data type and that is the reason why no declaration of a pointer generically is permitted to refer to any element but a pointer must be defined in the context of the data type which it refers to and that is why we have star uh, float star something int star something short int star something double star something okay i will request that if there are any other questions please send these through email and i will try to compile the answers uh, thank you very much for bearing with me